Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, <coughs> excuse me, verses 1 through 14, our text verses verse 13. We're going to do a responsive reading as we normally do. So let's all stand again as we read God's Word together. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Just one more time, stretch your legs, let's honor the Lord in His Word before we settle down to some preaching. Verse 1, I'll start in verse 1, then we'll read every other verse together. It says here, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Ready? While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease, because they are few, and those that look out the windows be dark and ready, and the doors be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall be, rise up at the voice of a bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. And when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to the, his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Ready? Or ever the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God, who gave it? Ready? Vanity and vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he taught the people, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Ready? The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was of right, even words of truth. Words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one's shepherd. And further by these my son be admonished of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let's read verse 13 together. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wisdom that we read today from a man who was in his golden years. He was just getting close to entering into eternity, and he turned around and he gave us these bits of wisdom which we find in Ecclesiastes. And we pray that you would use this message, that you'd speak to our hearts and help us to start our year off right, and thank you again for the great group that has assembled here at Faith Baptist Church, and we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Ecclesiastes is written by, once again, an elderly man in the sunset years of his life, and he uses a lot of symbology in this chapter just to, dis- to describe the way it is when you're elderly, you know, you, it says the grinders are few. In other words, you lose your teeth. And you, it says the, wall, the, the windows are darkened. You lose your sight. You know, you, you know, the music is brought down low. And in other words, you're losing your hearing. Uh, he's, he's, he talks about these different things. I've noticed as I've gotten a little bit older, I've noticed that I can't see so well when it's darker. You know, and I notice that now. I, you know, I, it, my eyes have changed. And I... Uh, I can't read, and in, in, I have to have light. I have to have, I have to have a light on me in order to, to read things and to even preach. Many times I, I have to have a, a, a strong light, and, uh, and sometimes that doesn't help completely. But uh, it's just the way it is. As you get older, th- things start to fail, and, and uh, hearing goes, eye, eyes go, a lot of things go. And, uh, and our, health, our health changes, and... And, you know, he says here, uh, that he, there's no pleasure in the day because, you know, the, he just knows that he's, he's not going to get through the day very healthily and different other things there. 
And then he gets to the end, and it's kind of a negative statement in verse 8. He says, vanity of vanities, all, said the preacher, all is vanity. Uh, yet, he goes into the last part and becomes very philosophical. And I like where he summarizes it in verse 13, and our, that's our text verse. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So out of everything, the whole book that's written here, he says, this is what I want to do. I want to come to a conclusion. I want to summarize this book of Ecclesiastes. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to fear God, and I want you to keep His commandments. And notice it says, for this is the whole duty of man. So if we have a duty, if we have a, if we have a job to perform, this is what he says for us to do. We're supposed to fear God, and we're supposed to keep His commandments. So I entitled this message, Trust and Obey, because if you look at fearing God, that is a trust. Uh, it's a respect. It doesn't necessarily mean, it does mean that we should be afraid of what God will bring upon us if we don't obey Him. Yes, of course. But I believe it is more than that. It's actually a, a, a reverential respect for God. Okay, that we're going to trust Him, that we're going to respect Him, and that we're going to trust Him. And if, you know, if I respect somebody, then I will trust them. If I don't respect them, I can't trust them. I can't trust somebody I don't respect. Is that true? Yeah. If I have a hard time respecting them, I have a hard time trusting them. Well, listen, you can respect God, and therefore you can trust Him. So that's the first part, is, is, is the area of fearing God. And then the second part is to keep His commandments. Of course, that's, that's easy. That's obey. Keep His commandments. Just obey Him. Do what He says. Yeah, this, you know, if you read Psalm 19, 119, it talks about God's commandments. This is God's commandments. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament, all 66 books of the Bible are God's commandments. You know, we talk about the Ten Commandments. Well, okay, uh, those are chief commandments, and I think we ought to all memorize the Ten Commandments. And if you haven't memorized the Ten Commandments yet, you ought to. But even so, there are loads and loads of commandments in the Bible. In fact, this book is full of commandments. It is a book of commandments. And so the Bible says that we're supposed to keep His commandments. And then notice it says, this is the whole duty of man. So that's your purpose. This is what you need to do. It's your job. It's not just the job of the pastor to fear God and keep His commandments. It's the job of every Christian to fear God and to keep His commandments. It's the whole duty of of man. And so this is what God tells me to do. This is my whole duty. And as I get older, I realize that time is flying. Amen. And I, I think about the fact that I'm turning 48 uh, next month. Next month, 48. And I think, 48? Wow, time has flown. Well, then you start thinking very soberly. And I know some of you, 40, 48 would be nice to, to, to come to again, amen? Uh, but, but what I'm saying is, yeah, you say 48, boy, I, well, that was a long time ago, 48, okay, all right, well, I'm getting to it. And as I come to my birthday next month, uh, you all want to know what my birthday is, it's the 17th of February, okay? I should just put it in stars and everything, 17th of February uh, next month is my birthday, I uh, was born in 1964, so 48 is my age coming up. And, uh, you know, as I get closer, I think, okay, and I'm doing the math. 48, okay, 70 minus 48 is what? 22, right? Come on, help me. Don't look at me strange, and you're all looking at me funny. And 22 years, isn't that right? 22 years until I'm 70. Now, that's sobering. Because I'm going, to, I'm going to quote to you in just a moment a verse uh, found in Psalms chapter 90. We'll just quote it to you in a minute. But I want to talk about the fact, you know, in 22 years time, nearly, I'm going to be 70. And I need to do something with those 22 years. I really do. I want to do something with those 22 years. If God gives me 22 years, now I may not get 22 years. I know some people that a dear man, a dear, a dear evangelist man that just passed away. He was 60. And then it was like two years previously, another evangelist, uh, man, great man, good man of God. He died when he was 60. So they only got 60 years of life. So if that was my lot, then I would only have 12 more years left. Uh, and that's sobering. You start thinking about that. You start thinking about the fact that life can end and, and uh, I don't know how much time I have. 
And so what am I going to do? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Well, that's very sobering when I think about it. And it ought to be sobering when you think about yourself too. You ought to be thinking very soberly through life. And you ought to think... You know, you know life is an illusion. We get this illusion that we're going to live forever. That's an illusion. Can I tell you that? It's an illusion. Life is an illusion. Don't think you're going to live forever. Okay? Live day to day like it is your last day on earth. And if this was your last day, would you like to be before Jesus? It would be a good question, isn't it? If this was your last day alive, would you like to be standing before Jesus? Or would you like to have a little bit more time to make things right? And I think everybody would say, I'd like to have a little more time, please. Amen? You say, well, I'm just a young man. I've got a whole whole many years ahead of me. Let me tell you something. There's no guarantee that you're going to have a day tomorrow or a day next week. There's no guarantees. Life is an illusion. Don't get this idea that you're just going to live forever because that's an illusion. Okay? It's very fleeting. It's very fleeting. You fly away. And so, I'm listening to the wise men. That's the wise thing to do, right? The wise thing to do is to listen to the wise man. Well, the the wisest man next to the Lord Jesus, I would say in the Bible, is Solomon. Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. didn't write them all, but most of them. Of course, they come down from God, amen? But Solomon definitely wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. You ought to read the book of Ecclesiastes tremendous wisdom there. It's very sobering. So what am, I to, what am I to do with the last 22 years? Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my duty. I'm going to do my duty. And what you ought to decide to do, not just make a New Year's re- resolution, but why don't you just decide today that you're going to do your duty the rest of your life too. And what is that? Well, verse 13 again. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. <coughs> Fear God. Fear God. That's the first thing. That's what we're supposed to do. Do you fear God? By the way, that's the trust. Once again, when I talk about fear, and that's our first, my first point, but when, when I talk about fear, I'm talking about respect with a holy reverence for the Most High. That's a respect for your God. Now, in normal living, like I said, if I live a normal life, I'm hoping that I will see him in about 30 years. Okay? And I want to give you a verse here. It's found in Psalm chapter 90, verse 10. You can write it down. Uh, If you go there quickly, you can get there quickly, fine. But if you can't, just look intelligently at the page you're at. But but listen to me, I'll just just give it to you. It says, in the days of our years are three score years. Now, a score is 20 years. Okay? So three times 20 is what? 60 and 10. So 60 plus 10 is what? 70. So that's where I get the 70 from. Okay? It says here in Psalm 90, verse 10, and I'm a Bible believer, it says the days of our years are three score and ten. We get 70 years. Most everybody will get 70 years on this planet. That's what the Bible says. But then it says, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, or four times 20 is what? 80. So you get 80 years by reason of strength, they be four score, score years. And then it says, Yet is there strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. And we had that song, I fly away, O oh glory. Yeah, that one. We get cut off, we die, and we fly away. 80 years of age. If we have the strength to live 80, it says... Now, what we need to do, first of all, is we need to leave this illusion that time goes on forever. Leave that illusion, okay? Just leave it. Walk away from that illusion. It's an illusion. Oh, I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll wake up the next day and I'll wake up the next day after that. Leave that illusion. Okay? Time will fly. So what are we supposed to do? Respect God. 
Respect God. You need to respect Him. Well, I'd like to take every Christian in our city and every Christian in our world and I'd like to just take us all and I'd like to say, we need to respect our God. We need to respect Him. Now you say, how do I respect God? Well, let me give you a couple areas. First of all, you need to get your assurance of salvation settled. Assurance of salvation settled. You need to be assured that you're on your way to heaven. If there's some niggling doubts in your heart that you don't know you're going to heaven, you better come and see some of us and make, come and see me. I'll make sure, I'll, we'll take the Bible and we'll show you so that you have that assurance of salvation. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 that we need to prove ourselves whether we be in the faith. Yeah. It says know your own self. Know that Christ be in you. The truth. We need to make sure that we have eternal life dwelling within us. 1 John chapter 5 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, if you're here today and you don't have the assurance of salvation, you think, well, I've got years and years and years to deal with this. You do not know that, my friend. You do not know that. Now, I'm hoping that you have years and years to deal with it. I'm hoping that you're going to see Christmas this year. I'm hoping that you're going to make it through this year. But guess what? There may be somebody here that the sound of my voice, you're not going to see Christmas this year, and I may not see Christmas this year. Better make sure that you have your assurance of salvation. That's respecting God. That's respecting that book right there. Because that that book right there says that if you don't trust Christ, you're not going to go to heaven. And if you don't go to heaven, where are you going to go? You're not going to float around like some ghost. Woo! You're not going to do that, okay? You're not going to haunt the the land. That's a myth. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to the place where the devil and the angels will end up. And that's the place commonly known as hell. And I don't want you there. I don't want anybody there. God doesn't want you there. He didn't make hell for you. He made hell for the devil and his angels. He didn't make it for us. But if you want to, if you want to ignore the gospel... If you want to ignore eternal life and you think, oh, well, you know, and listen, I, there are times when preachers, they, oh, well, we're going to have a Christmas, we're going to have a next week. I mean, listen, I, 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 I preach with a sense of urgency because we do not know how long we have to live. Now is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation. Get it settled now. Trust Him. Boy, if you trust Jesus Christ, He will not let you down. If you trust Him, Listen, I've trusted people. They've let me down. I've trusted people. They've stabbed me in the back. But that's the way man is. Man will do that. But God will never let you down. God will never let you down. I trust Him. He's taking care of me. I've asked for grace. He's given me grace. I've asked for improved faith. He's given me that. I've asked for, I've asked for love for people. I've asked for power. God has given me these things. He's given, because I trust Him. I respect Him. And I know that He will honor His Word and He will honor to me because He loves me and He loves you too. And He will save you if you come to Him. As Jesus said, He that heareth My Word and believeth on Him that sent Me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. Listen, all you've got to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ and He'll save you. Understanding. Understanding that you can't save yourself. Understanding that you're, that we're all sinners. That you've sinned. That I've sinned. That we've all sinned against the Holy God. That's not respecting, by the way. Is it? That's why he says in, in Romans 5, 8, he says that God commendeth His love toward us even while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He looked down and he says, they're still yet sinners, but he says, I sent my Son to pay the price on Calvary for the sin of mankind. He died for us. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, you've got to trust Him. Don't leave this life without trusting Him. And then, and then you say, well, I have trusted Him. I have accepted Him as my personal Savior. What do I do now? Okay, this is what you do. You get right. You get right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I want to read, and if you would please, go to Psalm chapter 14. 
Just a few verses, a few chapters in head of Ecclesiastes. And look at what this says here. This is obviously somebody who doesn't respect the Word of God. In Psalm 14, verse 1. I want to show this to every professing atheist. This verse. Look at verse 1 there. Look what it says. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What does God call a person who says there is no God? It's not me calling him a fool. Who's calling him a fool? This book's calling him a fool. Who wrote it? God did. It's God's word. So I believe that. And so the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Why? They have no respect for him. You see, people who, who, who don't believe in God will have any respect for him. And I said that to a young man not too long ago. I was talking to him. I said, I said, it's a convenient excuse for you to misbehave because you don't believe. He says, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I said, that's a convenient excuse, isn't it, young man, so that you can behave with that young lady you're sitting next to. I said that to him. Boy, he got his eyes all wide open like that. I said, that's true, isn't it? That's his convenient excuse. Convenient excuse, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Sure it is. Boy, he thought about that for a minute. The fool has said... What does it say here? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are what? What does it say there? They are what? Corrupt. They have what? They have done what? Abominable what? works there is none that doeth good the lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any that did understand and seek god what happened verse three they are all gone aside they are all together become filthy there is none that doeth good no not one we are living in a time of absolute disrespect for the things of god now what we need to do now she well pastor you know what there are times when I've done things wrong and I've disobeyed God and I've not respected Him. But you're here today and you want to make things right. God, God honors that. And if you honor that, if you say, well, look, I want to, I'm going to respect God from now on. I'm going to do what God says. That's your duty. You know what? I've been there too. We're all sinners. I'm not condemning anybody in here. I'm just telling you that at this point of our lives... You're here today. You came on Sunday. You got up. You got ready. You came to church to hear the Word of God. You need the Word of God. You need a pastor that will tell you the truth. Amen? And that pastor is telling you from the Word of God that we need to respect God. And we we look around us and we say, but pastor, there's so many people that disrespect God. But that doesn't give you an excuse to disrespect God, does it? No, it doesn't. It gives you no excuse at all. You need to respect God. Because that's what the Bible says. Can I say this? I didn't prepare this message for any person in this room today. I I didn't prepare this message with anybody sitting here in mind. This comes from Him. I believe that. I'm not going to preach to one person and keep everybody hungry. That's not I don't do that. I'm going to preach to the whole church. Amen? But we all need to do that. And I think we can all take something out of this message and say... I need to respect God because my life is not completely respecting Him. Yeah? Because soon we're going to die. Soon we're going to be with Him. Soon, and you can't, listen, you can't hide from God. Can you? You know? Like that little boy, I've talked about this before, you know, the little boy that gets his hand in the biscuit tin, you know, gets his hand in the biscuit tin and hears the foot, footsteps coming and they're getting closer and closer and it sounds like a giant, you know, boom, boom, judgment time's coming. And he quickly closes the, the lid, wipes his hand, mouth, but can't get every little crumb there. And here comes mum, boom, boom, boom. His eyes are wide. His hands are clammy. He's sweating, cold sweat. Have you been in the biscuit tin? Can't hide it, can he? Uh-uh. No, I haven't been in the biscuit tin. 
silly kid. You've been in that biscuit tin, haven't you? Just recently you were in the biscuit tin. Mm -hmm. You're not going to hide it from God. You can't hide it. What's he saying? Respect him. And if I respect my mother, if I respect those that are in authority over me, I will obey. I will trust. Let me get to the obedience part because I'm getting ahead of myself. We need to fear God. We need to trust Him, but we need to keep His commandments. We need to obey Him. Folks, this has been my book. This is my book. Is this your book? You say, this is my book. Is it? Is it really? Is it really your book? Because if, we, if it is your book, then you're going to keep it. Right? What does it mean to keep? It means it becomes a part of your life. You guard it and protect it. Is this book a part of your life? Is it really? You say, you know what, Pastor? I have trusted Christ, but I don't think the Bible is a part of my life. Can I tell you, you're not really doing the duty for which you were brought here to this earth. You were brought to this earth to obey and keep it. God gave you this book, not to throw in the street, not to ignore, but to obey it. That's why He gave you it. That's why He gave me it. And I know there are times when, when we get into temptation and we oh, man, and, and we try to ignore what's written in this book. But can I tell you something? Every time we do that, we are disrespecting God. And even as Christians, we're disrespecting God. You say, well, I lose my salvation? No. But God's not going to be happy with you. It's just like the, you know, the police officer's not going to be at every red light, but if I keep running red lights, and I go, <laughs> sooner or later, something's going to happen, and they're not going to be smiling, are they? No, they're not going to be smiling when they pull. Well, they may be, they may be smiling later when I have to pull out my pocket and pay the money, huh? Yeah. And God's not smiling when, and, and I know this is a very sober message. I can see everybody's looks on their face. You're just like, is there anything good about this message? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of good. It's been my book for nearly 30 years, and you know what? I don't have any plans to change. This is my book. You say, well, what if you're wrong about the Bible? What, you know, yeah, people do that, don't they? You know, if they don't believe it, they want to find a way to pick it and discredit it. You know, that's what they do. They just pick at it. You know why? Because nobody likes to be the bad guy. So they're going to pick at it and discredit it. You say, well, what if you're wrong, Pastor? What if you're wrong that this isn't the... This isn't really the Word of God. Well, you know what? If this isn't really the Word of God, I'm not wrong, but if, if I was, I haven't lost anything. Have I? No, I haven't lost anything. I haven't wasted my life because this Bible made me a better person. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So I haven't lost anything. I've definitely gained more than the guy that has no anything. And they just do whatever, they, whatever feels good, whatever feels right. Listen, if people live by whatever feels good or whatever feels right, you know what happens to that? It's called dead end city. Stop sign. Breaking watches. I know I'm right. You say, how do you know you're right? <laughs> the undeniable truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He arose from the grave. We have historical, accurate historical proof in secular history that Jesus Christ was sent to a trial and nailed to a cross by the Romans. And we have secular writers, more than two, 
I can think of Tacitus and, and Josephus. Both of those talk about early Christianity. That's secularism. Those are people on the outside of the Bible, written about the Bible, written about Christianity, and they have said, yeah, there, were, there, there was this man named Jesus Christ. He did live on the earth. And he did die on a cross. And three days later, he did come out of a grave. This is what they reported. You say, well, what if the apostles were wrong? Are you telling me that, it, would you give yourself for a lie? Anybody here that would give themselves for a lie? If you knew it was a lie, would you give your life for it? Because I certainly wouldn't. Have you ever heard about the church? Um, it was like in Russia or some, somewhere in the Eastern Bloc. And there was these um, soldiers that came in. This is a true story. I've read about it. But they, they came into this church and they had these rifles, these Kalashnikov rifles. You know, like AK-47s and all that. They come in there and they say, okay, everybody line up against the wall. This was an illegal meeting, by the way. They weren't supposed to meet for church. There are countries like that in the world today. So these people are, you know, they get up against the wall. They're all afraid. They got these men, these, these tough-looking soldiers with Kalashnikov rifles, lining them up. And he says, okay, if you're not a true Christian, get out. So a few people left. And there, there, were still, there were still quite a lot of people standing there, shaking, ready to die, ready to get shot. The soldiers put the, the rifles back on the holster, you know, they, on their shoulders and said, we're Christians. We just want to make sure that everybody here is a Christian. <laughs> what would you have done, huh? What would you have done if the soldiers came walking in here and said, okay, everybody up against the wall. If you're not a Christian, get out. Would you go, okay, man, I'm out of here. Don't you want to kill me? Kill me. Just make sure it's painless, okay? Just get it over with real quick. I don't like pain me. But what am I saying? I'm saying you wouldn't die for a lie. You have to be the truth. Yet thousands and perhaps millions of people have given their life for Christ. For what's written in this Bible. People have gone to the stake for this Bible. People, apostles have died for the Bible. For the truth, for the resurrection. You read about the tradition, for traditions, the stories about the apostles after, the, after they, they had their ministry and Practically every one of them was martyred except for one, and that was John. And he was dipped in a, a, a vat of boiling oil, it is said. That'd be fun. No, it wouldn't. It'd be awful. They gave their life for Christ. They gave their life for a lie? I don't think so. They gave their life for the truth. Because it is true. I know it's true. Listen, all they had to do was take the bleeding, dead body of, of the Lord Jesus. They, all they had to do is take his body out and say, here's his body, get over it, go home. And, and Christianity would have been a non-starter. It would have never started. But they didn't do that. He came out. It's true. And I'm giving the rest of my life to it. The rest of my life to the preaching of it. I'm giving the rest of my life and I want to be obedient to this book and I want you to join me. I want you to trust Him too. By the way, when I trusted Jesus as my personal Savior, He changed my life. I'm a miracle. He changed me. Now, did He do that with you too? When you trusted Him as your personal Savior, did He change your life? You mean the saving power of Jesus Christ still works today? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. He changed my life. I have people say, how do you know that Christianity is true? I said, look at me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. Like me. Yeah. We all look at it. We're all wretches. <laughs> and God saved us. He gave us eternal life. We put our faith in Him. It's real. It's real. So I want to give my life to it. 
I want to trust Him with my life. Because I know that if I trust Jesus with my life, He will never let me down. You say, what if you get cancer? I'll trust Him through the cancer. What if you get this or you get that? I'll just trust Him. Whatever comes my way, I will trust in Him. And I will not be let down. And then I'm going to obey Him. I want to obey this book. As I get closer and closer to the day that I meet Him, I want the Lord to look down and say, that servant of mine served me and loved me and loved my book and was real. With you know, I remember years ago, um, my, my, my wife's brother, he says, so you're going to do this Jesus thing? I said, yeah, yeah I'm going to do it. Yeah. He says, if you're going to do this Jesus thing, then be real. Would you be real? And boy, I took that as a challenge. I thought, well, okay. Here you have a man who probably don't even know if he's a Christian. And he's telling me, would you be real? That's what I want to be. I just want to be real. I want my life to measure up in private as it is in public. Now, what does your life do in private? Does it measure up with this book? as it would in public? Because if it doesn't, can I, take, can I give you that challenge too? Be real. What do you need to get right? I'm not directing this to anybody here. But this book here is my resource for truth. This, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm giving my life to this book. The rest of my life. Hey, listen, I, I know people... It, you know, the, the, the Korean president, he just died. He gave his life to communism. All right, he wants communism, he can have it. He's got blood on his hands too. And Stalin gave his life to com- communism. And there's other people that gave their lives to other things. They gave their lives to this and they gave their life to that. There's guys that blow themselves up, they give their life to Islam. Fine, they can give their life to Islam. If they want to give their life to Islam, that's their, that's their prerogative. Wish they wouldn't take other innocent lives with them. But let me just say this. I'm going to give my life to this book. Would you give your life to this book too? Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. What's your duty, my friend? What's your duty, mister? Ma'am? What's your duty? Fear God and keep His commandments. That's exactly right. And God says, you say, but, but pastor, I've got things in the past. All right, under the blood of Jesus. You trust Jesus? Put it, put it under His blood. Put the past under the blood of Jesus. And then reach for... You know, let me, let me just close with this verse. You know what Apostle Paul said when he was faced with, what about the past? Because some of you, you have ghosts in your past, don't you? They come back to haunt you. True, isn't it? It's like the ethereal skeleton in the closet, you know? In the cupboard. We say cupboard, sorry. You know, you got that skeleton in the cupboard, you know? And you, every once in a while you want to see if it's there, right? And you open the door and it's still there. Ah! Let's close the door again. There's that skeleton again. Well, you know what Apostle Paul did? And I'm kind of alluding tonight's message a little bit. But, but still come tonight. This is what he said. Look at this. Verse 13 of Philippians 3. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You know what you need to do? That's what, that's a, what Apostle Paul did. He said, I'm just going to forget my past and reach forward to the future. That's good advice, isn't it? Don't live in the past. Live in the present. You can't do anything about the past. I've preached on this before, but you can't do anything about that. But you can do everything about what you're, what you're doing now and what you're going to do. And if you make a decision, my book, God, I'm going to respect him from now on. 
not the beginning of 2012 until I mess up, but from now on, I'm just going to keep respecting Him. Even if I mess up, I'll just get right and keep going. Amen? I'm going to fear God. I'm going to keep His commandments. And Solomon says, hey, end of life. I'm on my deathbed. Come around, young people. Gather and hear what the wisdom I have to tell you. Let me give you a conclusion. Fear God. Keep His commandments. He says, that's the whole duty. Whole. Whole means all of it. Duty of man. And all I want you to do is do your duty. Amen? Just do your duty. And if you're not doing your duty, then why don't you decide to start doing your duty? And if, and by the way, if you don't fear this book, it's probably because you don't even know this book. Get into the book. And I've challenged you last week, and many people took the challenge, and I've had people come back to me and say, I'm, I'm reading my Bible. Good. Get to know it. But not only get to know it, obey it. Don't just understand it intellectually. Obey it. Physically and spiritually and emotionally, in every area of your life, just obey it. You say, that's impossible. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. God doesn't give us a command without the ability to obey it. You can do it. But do it. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. I'm done. And that was fast. It's a fast message.